ओके मैम ओके डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ फिजिक्स एंड केमिस्ट्री ऑफ सेंट जोसेफ इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी इज प्राउड टू कंडक्ट द फोर्थ टॉक ऑफ द 3 डेज एफडीपी ऑन फ्रंटियर्स इन साइंटिफिक रिसर्च एंड टेक्नोलॉजी ग्रेशियस रिस्पांस एंड एक्टिव पार्टिसिपेशन वाज रिसीव्ड फ्रॉम द बिगिनिंग ऑफ दिस एफडीपी एंड वी एक्सपेक्ट द सेम दिस टाइम टू researchers teaching fellows students and faculties where are pillars of the event understanding your anxiety to know about the speaker of the session let me start you to the speaker dr r justin josephus respected sir receive his phd in the area of nano crystalline magnetic materials from university of madras and is pursued his post doctoral research in tohoku university sendai japan He joined the Department of Physics as faculty in NIT Trichy by 2007. He has published more than 40 research articles in international journals. His research career is astounding with nearly 800 citation index and 22 I-10 index. He is also an author of chapters in books, bio-inspired material synthesis, and single and two-phase flows. on chemical and biomedical engineering his research work is on soft and odd magnetic materials comprising of process magnetic nanoparticles mosbier spectroscopy magnetic nanoparticle hyperthermia and ion based alloys his current research interest is to attain enhanced magnetic properties in nanoparticles it's indeed her honor to receive read as award csir srf mexg research fellow japan coe fellow japan he has won the best poster award ishr and icstr 2006 japan but last but not the least chartered physicist by uk 2012 adding further to his cap are the two projects funded by dst india he also had projects research on order disorder studies in chemically synthesized iron cobalt alloys dst kk sukubu japan by 2014 with this exhorbiting note i hand over the session to dr justin so please rein us with your knowledge in the topic magnetic nanomaterials for emerging application thank you sir thank you dr ramya for the introduction uh, so i welcome all the participants uh, uh, for this uh, session on magnetic uh, nanoparticles for uh, emerging applications so uh, i understand that you no know, uh, there is a mixed audience so uh, i will try to uh, uh, my i will try to justify the talk uh, to the uh, to the diverse uh, audience so i have uh, segregated uh, the talk uh, as uh, two different types that is no first type like uh, our first part it is uh, basics fundamentals uh, regarding nanoparticles characterization Okay, and uh, uh, few of the applications, and the second part is on uh, uh, the applications which we focus in our laboratory. Okay, so this will be the uh, contents. So uh, regarding magnetic uh, nano nanoparticles for uh, emerging applications, there are a lot of uh, Uh, emerging applications uh, but uh, we cannot uh, focus on all the applications within this short duration of time so that's why you know i have uh, uh, focused my talk on uh, one or two applications okay so uh, i belong to the department of physics national institute of technology and uh, we at the magnetic materials laboratory focus on the Uh, synthesis characterization and applications of uh, magnetic nanoparticles uh, especially for biomedical applications so i will focus my talk on these aspects okay. so uh, when we go towards uh, 
understanding magnetic uh, materials you now we all know like you no know, uh, magnetic materials uh, are uh, classified into different types uh, like you no know, diamagnetic materials paramagnetic materials ferromagnetic materials ferrimagnetic materials okay and uh, among these uh, uh, magnetic uh, materials okay ferromagnetic and ferrimagnetic materials can be further uh, classified into soft magnetic materials and uh, hard magnetic materials okay. and we know that you no know, magnetic materials can be characterized by the hysteresis loop okay hysteresis loop so if you see here the x axis of the hysteresis loop hysteresis loop you see that you no know, uh, applied field h that is in oysters the unit is in your oysters that is uh, cgs unit and the y axis y axis it can be represented as magnetization okay. and the magnetization is represented in unit emu per gram okay. that is again cgs unit okay. so those who are uh, uh, new to uh, magnetic materials please understand Uh, the hysteresis loop and the CGS unit form that is hoisted for applied field and EMU per gram for magnetization. Now here I want to make a point okay, for those who are working in uh, magnetic materials, okay, or those who are working with the research uh, oriented uh, applications. Magnetization is different from magnetic moment. magnetization i told you the unit is emu per gram magnetic moment the unit is emu electromagnetic unit okay i am stressing here because now i have seen many papers with mistakes like now you may put magnetization but unit you may have put as emu that is wrong okay so magnetization means emu per gram so that is mass magnetization if it is if it is uh, volume magnetization it should be emu per cc and if it is molar magnetization it should be emu per mole these are very fundamentals so don't make uh, mistakes in uh, plotting the graph so so soft magnetic materials what are soft magnetic materials so in the, uh, in the hysteresis loop you have seen here hysteresis loop i have also told you what is uh, in the x axis and what is in the y axis so uh, in the hysteresis loop you see that uh, when you apply a magnetic field the magnetization increases from zero and reaches a maximum value and saturates there there is no further increase in the magnetization beyond a particular applied field so that region where the applied field sat makes the magnetization to saturate so that is known as the saturation magnetization and the saturation magnetization and the saturation field okay so if you uh, see the uh, x axis now y axis i have uh, told you okay saturation magnetization in the x axis you see that the first uh, hysteresis loop Uh, at the top it is showing a narrow loop the second one at the bottom it is showing a broad hysteresis loop so you see that this breadth okay so that breadth that determines the coercivity of the magnetic material okay so coercivity is the negative field required to make the magnetization zero okay. so we have seen the magnetization which is maximum that is saturation magnetization and then we make it to zero with the negative applied field and that is known as the coercivity the older literature they may represent as coercive force okay now i i want to make very uh, clear uh, you know, many of the people they they don't want fundamentals 
they want high tech results but with mistakes we should not make mistakes you you can do small work very very small work but there should not be any error in it that's the idea of learning okay why we want to learn fundamentals now is to avoid mistakes okay so if you see here one mistake i have pointed you okay magnetization this is this i am not telling for uh, first level worker okay even experienced person they are doing this mis mistake okay magnetization should be in emu per gram magnetic moment should be in emu that i have made it clear okay so the next one is the coercivity which i have told you let's see many of the very big stalwarts they are also uh, uh, representing in the form of coercive force now that was a very old convention okay so uh, coercive force uh, of course no it was uh, used to very uh, in the older days okay but you should remember what is the unit for force okay force it, the unit should be newton but if you see here the field x axis you have i have told you it's a field applied field it's oyster so it should be coercive field or coercivity not coercive force so you have to understand the basic physics point of view now you have to understand how we have to represent even very very small things in a very minute way okay so uh, this uh, slide i want to put make it very special because now this hysteresis loop is the very very important parameter which you have to uh, you know use in your uh, research articles and you should know how to represent it of course there are other units also uh, how, how we can represent in si unit okay and we have we can uh, use uh, instead of h you can use b so uh, i am not going into that because now i am i will be using uh, uh, similar units okay similar uh, cgs unit so uh, um, based on the breadth of the hysteresis loop or based on the coercivity okay, you can classify the magnetic materials as soft magnetic materials and hard magnetic materials okay so soft magnetic materials they have very low coercivity i hope now you have understood what is coercivity so soft magnetic materials they have low coercivity they are easy to demagnetize okay and easy to magnetize and hard magnetic materials they have very high coercivity okay. difficult to magnetize difficult to demagnetize or it has the ability to permanently stick to something like the fridge magnet okay fridge magnet is a hard magnetic material it is a permanent magnetic material okay so if you take an iron piece an ordinary uh, an ordinary iron piece that is a soft magnetic material it does not have the ability to permanently stick to something okay so these soft magnetic materials they are useful for high frequency applications as well as biomedical applications and the hard magnetic materials also known as permanent magnetic materials okay so they can be used as magnets okay and in recording applications so likewise okay and the strongest known uh, uh permanent magnetic material or hard magnetic material is ndfeb also known, known as uh, uh, neodymium ion boron magnet okay so nd2fe14b is the uh, formula so that is the strongest uh, hard magnetic material available as of now okay so that was in the 80s 84 85 that time uh, it was developed and uh, there are no new materials to break the hard magnetic uh, ndfeb magnet okay of course china has a lot of uh, resources rare earth resources so they are uh, the leading manufacturers of rare earth based uh, hard magnetic materials such as samarium cobalt and the ndfeb okay so uh, we will see other uh, basic aspects also how we get uh, magnetization okay so i told you, you know the history is loop we have uh, magnetization okay and uh, when you apply a magnetic field it saturates 
and that uh, saturation uh, magnetization that is known as saturation magnetization but i also told you uh, what is magnetic uh, moment okay, and the uh, cgs units is uh, emu okay so now if you have magnetic moment you divide by the mass it becomes emu per gram that is magnetization okay. but emu that is magnetic moment how do we get that magnetic moment okay the origin of magnetic moment is the charged particle which are in motion okay so charged particle means no electron electron is a charged particle okay it uh, the electron moves around the nucleus so in that case we have charged particle which is in motion so that will produce a magnetic moment okay now the electron is also spinning charged particle in motion it is also spinning so the charged particle the electron is having a spin magnetic moment as well as an orbital magnetic moment okay so the smallest possible magnetic moment the okay, smallest possible magnetic moment is represented as bohr magneton okay and bohr magneton one bohr magneton is equal to eh cross by 2m where eh is the charge charge of the electron okay h cross reduced planck constant m mass of the electron okay so now the question fundamental question is like uh, when you consider the origin of magnetic moment i told you charged particle will uh, give rise to a magnetic moment so proton is also a charged particle okay so uh, can we consider the magnetic moment contribution by the nucleus because in nucleus we have protons okay. this equation easily uh, suggest you no know, the contribution to the magnetic moment we mu b equal to e h cross by 2m okay. e is the charge m is the mass mass of the electron is 9.1 into 10 power minus 31 kg okay but if you take the mass of the proton okay so compared to the electron protons are heavier so mass it is in the denominator so magnetic moment bohr magneton is inversely proportional to the mass so from minus 31 kg to minus 27 kg so you have a decrease in the order of magnetic moment for the proton so protons contribution to the magnetic moment is negligible or in short the nuclear contribution to the magnetic moment is negligible so the magnetic properties of most of the materials magnetic properties of most of the materials are determined by the electrons okay magnetic moment of electrons okay spin magnetic moment and orbital magnetic moment of electrons okay so here i have represented only one electron one electron which has a uh, spin and one electron which has an orbital magnetic moment but in an atom we have number of electrons so we have to sum up the magnetic moment contribution to the lot of uh, due to the lot of uh, electrons uh, presence that is governed by hans rule okay so certain rules have to be followed so when you follow that rules and when we sum up we get the net magnetic moment so let us say now we have one bohr magneton contribution from electron and if four electrons are contributing let's say four bohr magneton so you have instead of one four bohr magneton okay contribution from four electrons okay which are unpaired uh, uh, spins so likewise now when you sum up all this magnetic moment you will get a very large magnetic moment so that's the origin of magnetic moment so magnetization you divide by the mass or you divide by the volume or you divide by the molar concentration okay so that is how uh, it works out okay so now uh, 
when we go towards uh, magnetization as i told you there will be spin magnetic moment orbital magnetic moment and hunt's rule has to be followed when we consider more than uh, one electron so then the atoms magnetic moment comes into picture okay because now atoms are made up of electrons and we have uh, uh, got the magnetic moment of an atom from the electrons uh, number of electrons present so now we have a very very simple relationship okay we have a very very simple relationship to get the total magnetic moment okay so mu total mu is not the permeability here uh, conventionally we write, write uh, mu as magnetic moment or even uh, we can write a smaller okay so mu total equal to gj mu b okay so what is mu b mu b is the bohr magneton smallest uh, possible magnetic moment okay so that uh, value we can easily compute from the relationship eh cross by 2m so g is the g factor okay so you have g factor okay you can uh, uh, very easily get the g factor when you know l and s l is the orbital uh, quantum number l is the spin quantum number okay so we can easily get g and j is also similarly the sum of orbital and spin quantum number okay so j is the net uh, spin okay means now sum of orbital and spin quantum number values and mu total is proportional to j you see here okay very clearly it is a very simple relationship the magnetic moment mu total is proportional to j okay so if you have lot of unpaired electrons okay which are contributing to a net spin j okay then the magnetic moment will be large okay so that is how we get magnetic moment okay for uh, an atom okay so remember this uh, relationship for is for an atom now if you take materials any material it is made up of lot of atoms okay so we have come from electrons to atom now material is made up of lot of atoms so now let us say the origin of magnetism okay whether it is ferro ferri anti ferro or para that distinction comes now how the individual atoms are aligned okay if the neighboring atoms are aligned parallel okay parallel and in the same direction that is ferro if one atom is having a magnetic moment large magnetic moment let's say 4 mu b up another is having a smaller magnetic moment 3 mu b but that is pointing down so 1 mu b, uh, 4 mu b up 3 mu b down so then 4 minus 3 1 mu b so that is ferri magnetic moment so if on the other hand you have 4 mu b up from the atom another 4 mu b down from the atom okay another atom so then 4 minus 4 that becomes zero so that is anti ferro magnetism okay so now let us say you have 4 mu b from one atom another 4 mu b from another atom if they are both the uh, both are pointing in the same direction the first case ferromagnetic case but if they are randomly pointed like this okay random direction if it is pointed in a random direction then that is paramagnetism so that's all about magnet magnetism okay so this single slide tells you okay, the classification of magnetic materials okay diamagnetism means no the cancellation like uh, similar to anti ferro right that care cancellation happens within the shell itself okay. so let us say like no you have uh, 1s2 1s2 shell so two electrons can be uh, occupied uh, can occupy in that shell okay 1s2 shell 
how will be the spin state of the two electron there one will be up and another one will be down policy exclusion principle okay so here the net magnetic moment is zero okay because the magnetic moments are cancelled inside the shell itself so there will not be any net magnetic moment at all so the material will be diamagnetic what are the examples no you see noble gases no. all the electrons are uh, uh, aligned okay and they cancel each other so you, there will not be any net magnetic moment so they will be diamagnetic okay. so if you want magnetization except diamagnetism then there should be unpaired electron unpaired electron means at least one electron should be showing a magnetic moment okay so that way you can classify as ferro ferri anti ferro and para and depending on the direction and magnitude you can classify as para anti ferro ferri and uh, ferromagnetic materials okay so uh, that is about uh, magnetization and there are these uh, uh, atomic uh, magnetic moment they can uh, combine and uh, for energy minimization they cancel uh, each other uh, forming uh, domains okay so that is uh, another bulk phenomena uh, so uh, next one is the coercivity okay so coercivity uh, as i told you coercivity or coercive field so that uh, means like if a material is having high coercivity means no it is hard to magnetize we require large magnetic field to magnetize that material okay so uh, magnetic field so let's say if we apply if you apply a magnetic field in one direction then if the magnetic moment is pointing to the field direction then we have successfully aligned the magnetic uh, Uh, material okay so depending on the direction depending on the direction of the applied field we can change the magnetic moment okay Now sometimes no if you apply a field in one direction okay, the moment will be pointing to some other direction it will not be uh, pointing along the field direction okay so if you want to point the moments magnetic moments or spin direction along the applied field direction we may have to give a larger applied field larger energy okay so then that material will be a hard magnetic material or a permanent magnetic material but the question is now what causes this type of high coercivity or what causes the material to behave in a uh, very difficult manner difficult to magnetize why it requires large applied field okay. so a very simple uh, reason is low we have the uh, spin orbit coupling so spin orbit uh, strong uh, spin orbit coupling that is what determines the coercivity of the magnetic material okay. so uh, now we will move on to the next uh, part how to characterize this uh, uh, magnetic materials okay now so far i have discussed to you about uh, hysteresis loop okay. so from the hysteresis loop you can uh, identify whether it is a soft magnetic material or a hard magnetic material okay. but what is the instrument with what instrument can you identify okay, a material to be soft magnetic or hard magnetic material okay. or how can you say that you no know, the material is soft or hard from the measurement of the hysteresis slope only obviously okay but using which instrument that is what uh, uh, you see here vibrating sample magnetometer so this instrument is used to measure the hysteresis loop of a magnetic material okay so uh, in uh, in the hysteresis loop i have already mentioned you about x axis that is applied field the y axis is the magnetization 
so applied field applied field means no we have to apply a magnetic field we can apply a magnetic field using an electromagnet so the electromagnet is given here okay so using the vibrating sample magnetometer we apply a magnetic field and in the apl applied magnetic field the response of the material in the applied magnetic field how it behaves so from that we can characterize the material as either soft magnetic or hard magnetic or even other types also we can also classify it as like whether it is ferromagnetic or paramagnetic or diamagnetic also okay so what is the principle behind this uh, vibrating sample magnetometer so uh, here is a sketch so there is a head drive what I have uh, is given in the diagram a head drive and uh, there is a rod sort of thing like here and at the end there is a sample and in between the uh, electromagnet we have the sample so electromagnet is uh, required to uh, apply a magnetic field and the head drive is required for a purpose okay to measure the magnetization how how we measure the magnetization the sample is magnetic okay and when you vibrate the sample okay in the presence of an applied magnetic field when you vibrate okay, up and down motion when you vibrate it then it will induce a emf and in the and emf will be induced okay so this is known as lenz law right so you may have done these experiments uh, in the school itself okay. so if you have a coil and if you pass a magnet inside the coil the, the galvanometer will be deflected so that is induced emf so the magnetic uh, uh, bar magnet will induce an emf so the direction of the emf will be such a way that you no know, it opposes the field so you have Lenz law, so induced EMF, Faraday's law. So the direction from that you see the Lenz law. The same effect is used here. Okay, so you have a head drive. At the end of the head drive, what is the purpose of head drive? Head drive is to vibrate the sample. Why you need vibration? Because no, like uh, the Lenz law effect has to be created, where you are placing the sample inside the applied. Uh, in, are in between the electromagnet so that is now you are subjecting the sample to in an applied magnetic field so and you are making the sample to come out come in come out come in so in that way you are measuring the magnetization of the sample from the induced emf okay so this instrument that's why it is known as vibrating sample magnetometer so you have uh, the head drive here we have this uh, electromagnet here and uh, we also have a gauss probe to measure the field okay. and uh, the induced emf will be measured uh, using a coil coil sort of arrangement okay. and uh, this will be fed to the computer and uh, from that we can plot the hysteresis loop so the x-axis will be the applied field from the electromagnet and y-axis will be the induced EMF from the lens law effect. That will be in voltage. That can be converted to EMU. I told you the magnetic moment unit is in EMU. Okay. So it can be converted to EMU using proper calibration. For example, nickel. Nickel is uh, used as a calibration uh, sample. So nickel uh, will give a magnetic... Uh, uh, moment okay of some uh, certain magnitude so now if you have a sample of uh, certain weight then uh, from that you can say that no the ma magnetic magnetization of nickel will be 55 emu per gram okay. so this much voltage will give this much emu per gram so like you know you can easily cal calculate okay. so the emf can be calibrated and we can plot that in terms of magnetic moment or magnetization so you have to give an input right sample mass you have to give or sample volume in order to plot emu per gram or emu per cc okay so now you may have got an idea suppose now if you are having a sample you may have a doubt 
how should this be the sample look like so now if you have a powder you need some specific quantity okay of the powder we can measure the uh, magnetic moment of the powder or magnetization if you know the weight okay. but if you give the powder and uh, ask you no know, sir i want the magnetization in emu per cc is it possible just think about it okay so it is a powder right so it has to occupy certain volume then only now we can have the volume magnetization emu per cc these are some uh, small mistakes which uh, people may make so uh, i hope uh, you are clear with this uh, uh, magnetic hysteresis slope and how we characterize them okay okay so another characterization uh, tool is mosbauer spectroscopy okay so i am uh, discussing these uh, characterization techniques because now i will be presenting some results uh, based on the hysteresis loop and uh, uh, mosbauer spectroscopy so uh, it is uh, it will be more appropriate if we had some introduction about uh, mosbauer uh, spectroscopy okay so Mosbauer spectroscopy can be used to characterize mostly ion based uh, samples and you may get spectrum in the form of a singlet okay, singlet single line or a doublet two absorption lines like this or a sextet six lines like this so when you have a magnetic sample depending on the nature of the sample you may get sextet doublet okay singlet so uh, are a combination of uh, uh, all these all of this you can have uh, two sextets okay doublet and a sextet but we should be in a position to interpret what is the origin of this doublet what is the origin of this sextet okay so in short no Mosbauer spectroscopy is a technique okay it's a recoil free emission and resonant absorption of nuclear gamma rays in solids so this technique is related to recoil free emission and resonant absorption of nuclear gamma rays in solids okay. i'm not going into the in depth fundamentals but uh i'm just telling you how uh, briefly uh, how to interpret the uh, spectrum okay. how we get this spectrum and other fundamentals no that is uh, that will be even a, a separate talk so here singlet so the singlet arises as a result of changes in the s electron density of the nucleus so like s electron density at the nucleus will change according to the electronic configuration okay. according to the electronic configuration so what you can measure is you now from the isomer shift we can measure the charge state whether it is ferrous state whether it is ferric state or neutral state so that can be measured from the isomer shift isomer shift means no shift in the spectrum from the zero velocity position okay. here in the x axis it is given as relative velocity and the y axis it is given as transmission of course no it is easy for you to get out of uh, what is absorption and what is transmission but what is relative velocity okay. so relative velocity means no what you have is no you are uh, uh, changing the energy of the emitted gamma rays by backward and forward relative motion okay 
understand it very clear carefully so what you have is you will be having a sample okay and on the sample you will hit with the gamma ray and if the gamma ray energy matches with your sample energy it will undergo resonant absorption okay but in uh, your uh, samples you now if you see your samples the energy levels will be varying according to the structure according to the environment so we have to match the gamma ray incoming gamma ray energy with your samples energy level so in order to do that we give a doppler effect okay so when you give doppler effect what happens when you make the gamma ray to come forward what will happen when it comes forward the energy frequency will increase means your energy will increase when it goes backward what will happen the energy will decrease okay so at some point no you will have a matching of energy level okay it can match either if your samples energy level is higher you will get an absorption peak at a higher and higher uh, uh, relative velocity because relative velocity means now it is coming uh, positive relative velocity means it is coming towards your sample that means high energy okay so i hope now you have understood in the x axis why we have relative velocity that is nothing but the doppler velocity which is given to match the energy spectrum of your sample okay so when you make a forward and backward motion you will have uh, so you are you will be having a drive you will be having a transducer drive which will make forward backward motion and that forward backward motion will match the energy levels of your sample once it matches then you will have an absorption so that is what now we have seen resonant absorption of nuclear gamma rays remember it's gamma rays okay it's a nuclear phenomena okay so when you have a six set like this six line pattern like this it is due to the presence of internal magnetic field okay six state presence of six state Im implies that no there is an internal magnetic field okay so internal magnetic field when will have when you when your sample is ferromagnetic or ferrimagnetic or anti ferromagnetic okay so from the spectrum we can identify whether the particular magnetic material is ferromagnetic or ferrimagnetic or anti ferromagnetic or otherwise no diamagnetic or paramagnetic if it is paramagnetic you will see okay either a singlet or a doublet okay if it is ferromagnetic or anti ferromagnetic or ferrimagnetic you will see a six step i hope now uh, it is very clear to you so if you see a six line pattern you can e e easily say that no it is not at all paramagnetic or diamagnetic okay so uh, now coming to the doublet okay so i told you like no if a material is uh, paramagnetic it can show either a singlet or a doublet when can it show a singlet and when can you it show a doublet okay now you uh, you see here the cube the cube is uh, given here so let us assume the center spot as a nucleus okay so if the nucleus is spherical okay let us assume that the nucleus is spherical when you are having a spherical nucleus okay it is a, a, it is not experiencing any asymmetry in the electric field experienced by the nucleus okay so when you have a spherical uh, nucleus there will not be any doublet okay it, it will show only a singlet okay so now when you are uh, nucleus is elongated when your nucleus is elongated okay when your the energy level is now changing so when your nucleus is elongated then it will show a doublet okay when can the nucleus uh, elongate 
when it is experiencing a difference in the or asymmetric electric field. So uh, if you have electrons which are exerting uh, electric field equally on all the sides of the nucleus, the shape will not change. Okay. On the other hand, if you have a nucleus which is having or which is experiencing electric field only along one side, then what will happen? It will show a electric field gradient. As a result, the nucleus will be uh, distorted. So it will move from the spherical shape to an asymmetric shape and that will be shown as a doublet. Okay? So that will be a paramagnetic case okay? with the electric field gradient or a distorted nucleus. So you, what are the inferences which we can get from this spectrum? We can find the charge state, as I told you, ferrospheric or neutral state from the isomer shift value. And whether you are having a symmetric uh, environment or your structure is more defective, if your substructure is more defective, then your electric field gradient will be there that will elongate the nucleus. So we can easily say, you know, this structure is, or your material is defective. So that will be the uh, inference from the doublet. And from the sixth step, we can say it is a magnetic, uh, if whether it is having magnetic field or not, or uh, whether it is ferromagnetic, etc., or even the type of uh, uh, material, magnetic material. Okay. From the magnitude of the from the magnitude of the internal field, we can identify the type of uh, magnetic material also. Okay. So now, uh, uh, with this uh, in introduction in mind, we will move on to uh, one of the properties of the uh, magnetic material that is superparamagnetism. Okay. So whatever I have told is about uh, uh, bulk uh, magnetic, magnetic uh, properties. Okay. Now, superparamagnetism is the property of a nanoparticle. Now, straight away, I am moving to the properties of nanoparticles, magnetic properties of nanoparticles. Okay. So, nanoparticles, when you are having a small size, okay, when you are having a very small size, the magnetic moment will fluctuate. Okay, the magnetic moment of a nanoparticle will fluctuate. As a result, no, uh, the energy, okay, so the energy that is anisotropy energy, okay, uh, that is less than thermal energy. Okay, no, in fact, no, I should tell you the other way that is, no, since kV is less than kBT, the moments are fluctuating. Okay, so what is kV? K is the anisotropy constant okay. that determines the breadth of the hysteresis loop or the coercivity. So, coercivity is proportional to K. If your coercivity is large, meaning means like no K is also large. Okay. Now, V is the volume of the particle. Okay. Volume means now when you are having a nanoparticle, volume will reduce, right? So, when you are going towards very, very small size, volume will reduce. So K into V is the anisotropy energy. So when you are having same K, but different size, then volume will change. As a result, what will happen now? KV will reduce for a nanoparticle. When KV reduces, what happens? The thermal energy. Let us assume that now T is room temperature. KB is the Boltzmann constant. So at room temperature, okay, K is constant. Then when you reduce the size, KB becomes smaller. So thermal energy will dominate. So when thermal energy dominates, the moments will fluctuate. Okay. So this fluctuation of the moment due to the reduction in size. So that is known as superparamagnetism. Okay. So I hope I have made the fundamentals very clear. So uh, now uh, we will go to the spectrum, Mosbier spectrum, Mosbier spectrum of uh, 
uh, small particles, how they look like. So you see here the uh, first uh, spectrum. So this is the spectrum of uh, magnesium ferrite. Okay. And uh, uh, I told you, you know, this uh, uh, spectrum, if it is a doublet, it, you know, it is paramagnetic. Okay. But here you see a doublet here. But magnesium ferrite is not a paramagnetic material. This is at room temperature. At room temperature, magnesium ferrite is not paramagnetic. But still, we are getting a spectrum similar to paramagnetic uh, spectrum. Okay. So this is due to size effect. Why? Because no, this is uh, due to the moments fluctuating and the measurement time. The fluctuation time is very fast compared to the measurement time. Like, no, so if, you're, uh, if a person is jumping once, no, we can measure. Okay, this person has jumped once. But if a jump, person jumps hundreds of times, no, you cannot keep on uh, counting within, uh, at that faster rate. Okay. So similarly, no, the instrument also will measure the mass bar uh, uh, measurement time. So that is also very fast for a super paramagnetic particle. So that will result in a spectrum which is similar to a paramagnetic material. Okay. So when you go towards low temperature, when you go towards low temperature, the measurement time now becomes come now uh, it's not that fast. Okay. So when you reduce the temperature, now we can uh, measurement measure the uh, spectrum, which is uh, uh, similar to a ferrimagnetic material. What we have seen the six tet six tets are seen here. So that is, uh, so remember, same material, so uh, with the different size, with the dif different size, 20 nanometer, first one is 20 nanometer, second one is 25 nanometer. So when you go from one size to another size, you, know, you are getting a uh, behavior that is not super paramagnetic behavior. And uh, in, if you increase this uh, 25 nanometer to much uh, larger size, you know, it, is, it will be showing a spectrum similar to the uh, 16 Kelvin spectrum. Okay, so that is one behavior of uh, super paramagnetic materials or nanoparticles. So uh, with this, we will move on to other uh, aspects of uh, uh, magnetic uh, materials. So uh, we are uh, our uh, research area uh, is diverse. Like uh, we are working with hard magnetic materials as well as soft magnetic materials and uh, its biomedical applications and uh, other uh, uh, applications as well. So uh, in the case of uh, biomedical applications, uh, we are dealing with the, uh, utilizing magnetic nanoparticles for uh, uh, drug delivery. We are uh, aiming for uh, uh, diagnosis as well as therapy. Okay. So in this regard, uh, I would like to point here uh, the applications of uh, magnetic uh, nanoparticles. So when you have a small magnetic uh, nanoparticle, you coat it with the drug and you deliver it uh, through uh, uh, your uh, bloodstream or uh, some uh, uh, parts of your body where it is mobile. And when you uh, deliver uh, that nanoparticle which has been coated with the drug to a specific region, tumor region, you, know, you would uh, deliver the drug locally. Okay, You deliver the drug locally into the region instead of the drug going throughout your body. So the normal chemotherapy or uh, either uh, therapeutic method you know, where you employ drugs, you know, the drugs can grow throughout our body uh, damaging other organs as well. But if you have a magnetic nanoparticle and if you coat it with a drug and deliver to a local region, then what happens now? You reduce the side effects associated with it. So magnetite or Fe304 uh, nanoparticles could be uh, used for such applications because it is biocompatible. And uh, you can uh, uh, use it for targeted drug delivery. But the thing is, no, we need uh, higher magnetization okay. because no, the 
drug coated uh, magnetic uh, nanoparticle has to be delivered using an external magnet. So we need higher magnetization. So higher magnetization, the choice is like iron. Okay. So already we have three or four uh, uh, mentioned. It has a magnetization of only around uh, 60 to 90 EMI per gram. But if it is iron, you have 220 EMI per gram to see the magnitude. But iron is as such not biocompatible. That is one uh, drawback. Okay. But it has high magnetic uh, uh, moment or higher magnetization. So uh, we em employ polyol process uh, for the synthesis of uh, uh, iron. So uh, polyol process is uh, generally used for the synthesis of cobalt and nickel. Okay. But cobalt and nickel uh, magnetization is also less compared to iron, as well as you know, they are much more toxic compared to iron. So uh, uh, forget about cobalt and nickel. If you go towards the synthesis of uh, iron, that itself is difficult because now iron will be easily oxidizing. It will easily turn to iron oxide. So in that case, no, we need a suitable uh, chemical method. So polyol process is a promising technique which can be used to synthesize iron. So uh, we can uh, use the polyol process to synthesize not only iron, but also a different uh, uh, materials uh, as shown here, like you know, gold, platinum, iridium, palladium. So these, all these materials can be uh, synthesized. Okay. Uh, this, uh, those materials which have a positive standard reduction potential, okay, very high standard reduction potential, they can be reduced. But if you see iron, no, that is having a low standard reduction potential. So that is difficult to reduce, but with additives uh, such as NaOH, we have uh, achieved the reduction of iron. So we can uh, obtain uh, elements up to iron. Okay. So once you get iron, uh, we can get other alloys as well. You know, because now if you have iron, we can get iron cobalt, iron nickel, because iron nickel is also there. So likewise now we can have binary alloys and ternary alloys. So that is one uh, advantage. Okay. So uh, after uh, preparing iron, then uh, we uh, uh, control the size of the iron. Okay. So the iron which we synthesized was uh, uh, greater than 100 nanometer. So for uh, biomedical applications and all, no, we need a, a smaller size. That is nanoparticles, iron nanoparticles. Nanoparticles means you no, know, they should be less than 100 nanometer, right? So when we uh, thought about uh, reducing the size of iron, uh, one way is to use a heterogeneous nucleating agent, uh, such as platinum. Okay, so very, very small concentration of platinum can reduce the size of iron. So using that, we have achieved size reduction of iron. So up to 20 nanometer uh, size could be obtained using iron. Then we have used the iron, uh, size reduced iron, uh, with the modified with the Prussian blue. That can be used for uh, detoxification. That is not removal of radio, radio uh, toxins. Uh, for that we can use. Okay. So this is how uh, it looks like. So uh, the first one is the bigger sized iron. So when you reduce the size of iron, you see a shell. Okay. So at the center, you see a iron, you see the iron. And uh, as a shell, you see iron oxide. Okay. So in a sense, no, iron oxide is somewhat more biocompatible. So if you have iron, okay, and if you have a shell, iron oxide shell, that is biocompatible. So we have higher magnetization from the iron and biocompatibility from the shell, iron oxide shell. So in this way sense, we can use it for biomedical applications. We need highly magnetic material. So iron is an ob obvious choice. So we can prepare iron nanoparticles and we can have a shell, iron oxide shell 
and use that for biomedical applications okay so uh, this is the only uh, way to prepare uh, iron uh, that is no size controlled iron there are other methods which may be uh, toxic okay so they like no pentacarbonyl reduction that method is available but that will give rise to carbon monoxide and some of the chemical methods no they require uh, two to three days of synthesis but you won't believe this method will take hardly one minute okay so next no from the synthesis of iron we have also prepared iron cobalt alloy okay so iron cobalt alloy uh, the uh, specialty here is like no when we synthesized iron the shape was uh, cubic as you can see from a figure a the shape was uh, cubic that is for iron and when we uh, synthesized iron cobalt alloy according to the composition of the alloy they uh, were either uh, cubic flower or spherical flower if it is an iron rich iron cobalt it is cubic flower if it's cobalt rich iron cobalt alloy it is spherical flower okay so this is the first time we have uh, obtained iron cobalt alloy with the flower like shape so generally when you prepare uh, materials especially iron based uh, materials using uh, chemical methods you may either get a, a cubic shape or a spherical shape but not a flower like shape okay so this has uh, advantages really okay so if you uh, sometimes now you may think you know with flower what what is the use this has a lot of advantages because you no know, nanoparticles have higher surface area as we know very well very high surface area so this flower like particles you no know, there are a lot of petal like uh, uh, structures as we can see so this has very high surface area so this can be used as a catalyst okay this can be used as an absorber okay so there are a lot of uh, applications emi sensors so lot of applications so once you have the particle then we can think about the applications so here we have demonstrated the preparation of iron cobalt flower like particles okay that is uh, nano structure okay so uh, next one uh, is about uh, how to characterize this iron cobalt we have seen the structure okay that is the morphology so how to characterize this uh, magnetic properties okay and uh, uh, i have uh, introduced you about uh, like uh, mospy spectroscopy so here i want to uh, tell you, you now what is the inference from this uh, mospy spectroscopy for the iron cobalt alloy so the xr x-ray diffraction pictures they show that you no know, it is only iron cobalt alloy and uh, the lattice parameter also tells that you no know, uh, they are varying according to the composition of the alloy so now when we take the uh mass bias spectrum of uh, 50 50 composition you have uh, six tert as well as a double tert you know? so when we further analyzed this you no know, we saw that you no know, the iron cobalt alloy is ferromagnetic okay? and it has two different iron environments mass bias spectroscopy can sense the ferromagnetic iron in two different environments two not only two more than one uh, environment so uh, this is uh, the two six tert they show they are in two different environment and the broad center portion that the that double like portion that is from the iron oxide shell so we have iron cobalt core and an iron oxide shell okay so this can be also used for biomedical applications because now iron cobalt has higher magnetization than iron so you have you can use this for biomedical applications and the biocompatibility can be taken care of by the shell that is the iron oxide shell okay and uh, uh, this uh, uh, picture shows the picture next picture shows that you no know, uh, you have size reduced iron cobalt okay here uh, we see uh, reduction in the size 
and uh, there is a shell of around 2.7 nanometer and we get the mass bar spectrum of uh, uh, this ion cobalt uh, uh, size reduced as well as the bulk we see that you no know, the core is contributing to a sister and the shell is contributing to a superparamagnetic doublet okay now uh, how can you say that you no know, it is superparamagnetic and not paramagnetic that i have already discussed okay when you go towards low temperature we can see you know the disappearance of the uh, doublet like pattern so uh, that was uh, observed so now uh, when you have iron okay, we can coat it with the uh, prussian blue that can be the drug and the peculiarity of prussian blue is you now it can absorb the uh, radio toxin such as cesium okay. so when you send the uh, iron which is coated with prussian blue through blood stream and if there are radio toxins they can attach to the prussian blue and then we can remove that using a magnet okay so we can use uh, fe3o4 coated with prussian blue as well as fe coated with prussian blue and use that for detoxification of radio toxic uh, cesium okay and uh, next application is uh, cancer therapy okay so uh, how we do uh, this uh, cancer therapy is if you have a tumor brain tumor okay? so uh, the uh, options available as of now is you no know, like uh, uh, surgery chemotherapy radiotherapy okay but these will have uh, their own uh, side effects right so due to the uh, radiation chemi chemicals so there will be side effect but if you inject the magnetic nanoparticles on the tumor okay, and if you apply a radio frequency alternating field it will heat the magnetic nanoparticles which are embedded in the tumor so that will destroy the tumor so you have only heating and no other side effect so comparatively you see this is one of the least side effect producing method for the treatment of cancer okay but uh, thing is no if you take a particular uh, type of uh, magnetic material depending on the size of the nanoparticle the heat produced also will change so that you see in the bottom graph where the heat will be maximum only at an optimum size so we have to prepare nanoparticles of optimum size to produce heat okay so that is uh, one thing we have to take care now we can control the size of the particle okay we can control the size of the particle using oxidation method okay. it is a method by, by which you know when you have more concentration of oxidant then for sudden nucleation fast nucleation will be there that will give rise to smaller particles but if you have low concentration of oxidant okay then the sudden nucleation is will not happen but growth will happen so you will have a larger particle so depending on the concentration of the oxidant you can have small particle or large particle okay. in that way we can control the size of the particle why do we require different sizes no because no for hypothermia we have to use only a optimum size okay an optimum size of uh, particle size range is required uh, to produce maximum heating so we need to test this also okay whether uh, uh, heating is produced by a particular particle or not okay so here uh, in this slide now we have uh, shown uh, left side graph uh, shows the theoretically simulated uh, uh, heating rate according to the particle size now you see that uh, the heating rate also changes according to the uh, material also no. fef means no it is magnetite co3 means no it is uh, cobalt ferrite and mn means no it is mn doped fe304 so you see here uh, cobalt ferrite 
the heating is uh, produced with the smallest size, but the heating rate is very small compared to the other uh, materials. So depending on the type of material as well as size, your heating rate also will, will change. So uh, in this uh, second uh, right side graph, we are seeing a few experimental uh, uh, results okay, where CO3 is showing the lowest uh, heating rate. Okay. So uh, this can be also verified. Size effect can be also verified. How size effect? Now this you see here in this graph, uh, the ring-like uh, picture. That is the thermography picture okay, of uh, the RF coil. Okay. At the center, you have the magnetic uh, nanoparticle. Okay. So when you give an RF frequency, it will heat the magnetic nanoparticle. So the coil also just gets heated up. That's why we see that ring here. And uh, at the center, we see the nanoparticle here. At five seconds, the heating just develops. And for 140 seconds, the heating rate has increased, heating has increased, temperature has increased, okay? So that you have seen from the white spot here. So, but if you see, depending on the particle size, how the heating varies, 10 to 12 nanometer particles in the left graph, that was showing very high heating rate, okay? You see here, delta T, the temperature change is large, for 12, 10 to 12 nanometer, whereas 60 nanometer particle is not at all showing any temperature change with respect to time. Okay. So as you uh, keep on uh, he, uh, like uh, supplying the RF uh, frequency with the time, no, 10 to 12 nanometer particles gets heated up, which can be used for treating the cancer. Okay. So uh, around 500 kilohertz uh, frequency is uh, required to heat these nanoparticles and uh, we can uh, use the magnetic nanoparticles for cancer therapy. Okay. So that is uh, another application. Not only like uh, cancer uh, therapy, we can also use it for diagnosis also. Okay. Diagnosis means detection. Therapy means curing. Diagnosis means detection. Okay. So uh, using thermography, we can use uh, thermography for detecting tumor also from the difference in the heating uh, characteristics of uh, the samples. Okay, so the thermal conductivity of normal uh, tissues and the uh, cancer tissues will be different. Okay? So when you embed the magnetic nanoparticles and apply a heat, so the normal tissues will showing will be showing a different contrast compared to the uh, tumor tissue. So from that difference, we can easily detect the tumor. That uh, This uh, slide shows a simulated image of the uh, uh, heating undertaken, okay? as well as experimental results. These are uh, left side, left uh, two figures. No, that was obtained from a high resolution uh, thermal camera at two different uh, temperature dura time, time duration. But from this, uh, uh, you cannot uh, easily say, okay, uh, whether you have a tumor or not. But when we process the image, okay, and when we uh, did further uh, image processing, we see the center uh, spot is showing some uh, difference in the contrast. So uh, you can easily uh, get uh, the tumor uh, identified using thermal uh, camera. So you. The point here I want to make here is no, we can use it for uh, diagnosis, we can use it for therapy, we can use it for drug delivery, delivery also, okay. Uh, detection, delivery, as well as treatment, all are possible using uh, this magnetic uh, nanoparticles. So uh, with this no, uh, not only no magnetic uh, nanoparticles are used in uh, uh, magnetic uh, uh, nanoparticles are not only used in biomedical application, but emerging applications you now such as you know, magnetic refrigeration, high energy product, permanent magnets. So that's that also, I have not discussed it in fact, but I would summarize that you now you can go for uh, uh, further exploration of this uh, uh, magnetic nanoparticles for uh, 
magnetic uh, application, uh, emerging applications such as in refrigeration and uh, also in uh, energy products. Okay. Uh, however, no. Uh, what we have to uh, uh, get the, from this uh, presentation, the message. What I want to give here is no. Uh, whatever uh, materials uh, we are uh, discussing, they are all like conventional materials. No new materials. So uh, conventional materials, but nanopore. So if you have uh, some new developments, new materials, then that will uh, uh, produce uh, uh, enormous benefits. Okay. So when uh, we can produce new materials, provided we have more fundamental understanding. Okay. So uh, so with this, now I would like to thank all of you. Uh, for listening to this uh, lecture. Uh, now I have to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, many people uh, like you know, uh, my scholars, uh, Mr. Uh, Arun, uh, Dr. Arun, Dr. Prakash, then uh, collaborator, especially Professor Greenwich, uh, my uh, Professor uh, Narayana Sami, Professor uh, uh, Jay Devan, so a lot of, uh, of course, DST also. So I uh, acknowledge all of them and uh, thank you for uh, listening to the lecture. I'll be happy to answer uh, uh, some questions based on the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. We Thanks. know it's uh, almost difficult to pin up the audience in the afternoon session after they lunch as a teacher. We know that difficulty, but you have disapproved it. Your session was really great. Uh, so many were really attentive in your session. Thanks a lot. Uh, but Thank you me. have a few questions that are roped in. I would like to tell you okay. the questions. Uh, the first question is from Mr. Tangaraj. Ah, yes. If any specific method available for converting insoluble metal oxides to water soluble? Uh insoluble metal oxide to water soluble as far as from my knowledge now it is uh, uh, no, difficult now if you have uh, like no very poorly crystalline form uh, like no, in our biological process they are uh, it is possible okay like you know you have ferry hydrate in our body uh, so when you are uh, having ferry hydrate no it is a storage type of uh, oxide our body is enzymes no they convert uh, to soluble form and uh, they uh, extract our body extracts the uh, solids uh, to uh, and converts to uh, ferrous and ferric states okay so uh, natural process there are uh, methods but i am not sure about no uh, uh, the synthetic synthetic uh, methods Okay, sir. The next question is from uh, Mrs. Uma Bardhan. What is the relationship between J factor, orbital, and spin magnetic moment? G factor. Okay. So G factor uh, it relates to the uh, magnet ratio between the magnetic moment and the uh, spin spin value. Okay. So for example, like you now if you have only spin. So if you have only spin, the G value is two. Okay. If you have uh, only orbital contribution, then the G value is one. Okay. So from that we can say, like, no, what contribution? Uh, uh, like, no, whether it is spin contribution or the orbital contribution. So the G factor relates to the uh, spin and orbital contribution of a magnetic material okay so if you have both okay, both uh, uh, spin and orbit then you have a uh, value uh, greater than two uh, or so okay. so from this no we can say whether your uh, uh, material will be exhibiting a large magnetic moment or uh, it will be uh, exhibiting a small magnetic moment so uh, uh, likewise, now this information about the magnetic uh, material can be obtained. 
especially the uh, spin and orbital contribution. Another question from the same madam. Any low cost method that is can be suggested for water soluble super paglab magnetic metal oxide preparation? Uh, method uh, method uh, means no, there are a lot of methods to prepare nanoparticles. Co precipitation method is uh, uh, one method, oxidation method is another method. So these are methods to prepare magnetic nanoparticles. Okay. But remember now, these nanoparticles are inorganic materials. So uh, they are not soluble in uh, water. Okay. But if you want to, if you are talking about soluble materials, then uh, don't think about this inorganic materials. You can think about other polymer based materials or some other, uh, some other materials, not these magnetic materials. Okay. Okay, sir. The next question is from Sarat Bhavan Murugan. Limit of HC, uh, we can say soft and odd behavior. Okay, so uh, if you are having a coercivity uh, HC of around uh, 1000 I state, say, okay, 1000 I state and above, then we can say it is a hard magnetic material. Okay? And if you are having a coercivity of less than, uh, let's say, uh, 10 I state or so, then we can say it is a soft magnetic material. So then it leaves like intermediate ranges. So uh, in the range of like 10 to uh, 10 oyster to one kilo oyster, a uh, thousand oyster. So they are uh, intermediate uh, materials that are uh, medium uh, magnetic materials. So, so there is an, uh, not, there is no sharp boundary. Okay, like no, this should be uh, like only 10 oyster. It will uh, gradually change. So depending on the application, we can have, uh, uh, soft uh, classification or hard classification, but in general, no, the soft materials have few uh, oysters, okay, less than 10 oysters or so. And hard magnetic materials means no kilo oysters, okay, 1000, above 1000 oysters. So that are hard magnetic materials. Okay, sir. The next question is from Tirupati. Can you please tell me few applications of anti ferromagnetic materials? Okay, so anti ferromagnetic materials, no. The reason applications are like you no know, in uh, spintronics. Okay. Although you no, know, the bulk met, uh, those uh, people who are working with the uh, uh, bulk uh, uh, characteristics, you no, know, they are not happy with the antiferromagnetic materials because you no, know, they don't have uh, sufficient uh, magnetization. Okay, so they are behaving like uh, they behave like uh, uh, paramagnetic materials. So, uh, but no, if you have a ferromagnetic uh, core and an anti-ferromagnetic uh, shell, so then there will be interaction, okay, or uh, uh, there will be a interaction between the ferromagnetic uh, core and an anti-ferromagnetic shell, and that interaction will give rise to exchange bias, okay, and this uh, uh, exchange bias property is. Uh, utilized in uh, spintronic application. So that is uh, one of the application of uh, uh, antiferromagnetic materials. Okay. So there are other applications also, uh, uh, like you know, uh, what you have uh, in refrigeration, etc. What could be the problems that are faced when insoluble super paramagnetic material is used in biomedical application? Okay, so uh, in our body, you know, when you uh, inject this uh, uh, su uh, super paramagnetic uh, nanoparticles, uh, we, we have to make sure you know, that it is biocompatible and uh, it is uh, remaining in our body for uh, uh, some time. Our body's uh, defense mechanism, what will happen is, you know, they will try to uh, you know, remove all the foreign objects from the body. So in order to fool our immune system, what we do is you now we will have to uh, coat the magnetic nanoparticle with the biocompatible shell. And uh, till the treatment time is over, now it will be remaining there. After this uh, treatment process, now our body will uh, remove this, okay? 
or uh, and it can be uh, deposited in the liver or kidney or spleen uh, whatever it is okay. so that is if you are having a large number of uh, magnetic nanoparticles which are being used in the uh, treatment pro process then what we can do is you know we can inject a catheter and we can suck out uh, using a magnet so what people do in dialysis you know, they are uh, removing the toxins so similar thing and uh, we can uh, similarly we can remove the magnetic uh, nanoparticles the next question is from nyanam selvaraj distinguish super paramagnetic materials behavior from ferromagnetic nanoparticles based on their grain size okay so uh, let's say you know if your uh, particle size is very large okay when your particle size is very large then uh, when you apply magnetic field you no know, your uh, uh, depending on the strength of the field you no know, you can align the magnetic moment direction along one direction one particular direction okay let's say you no know, hard magnetic material it will have a permanent magnetic moment pointing in into a particular direction because you no know, already we have applied a field and we have pointed the moment along a particular direction so now it is stable here like this so for a ferromagnetic material ferromagnetic hard magnetic material the magnetization direction is pointed upward like this is may imagine upward means no top is north and the bottom is south let us imagine okay so it is stable now so now when you reduce the size when you uh, bring down the size the north and south will not remain north and south okay it will try to fluctuate why because now thermal energy is dominating so it will try to fluctuate so it will it will uh, flip flop you know like uh, when you heat a glass of water you know, the thermal energy will try to randomize the molecules so similarly you know when you have uh, thermal energy is dominating what will happen the magnetic spin direction will not be Uh, pointed along a particular direction so it will randomize it is a ferromagnetic material but if the spins are uh, randomized so that is behaving like a paramagnetic material for a paramagnetic material the spins will be randomly pointed out but the magnetic moment will be very very small but for a ferromagnetic material the spins will be positioned in a particular direction and the magnetic moment will be large okay for a super paramagnetic material it is similar to ferromagnetic material in the sense like you no know, the magnetic moment is large but the spin is not stable it is fluctuating so it is behaving like a paramagnet so that is why it is known as super paramagnet so when you reduce the grain size or when you reduce the particle size it is behaving like a paramagnet but it is a ferromagnet so it has a large magnetic moment so uh, that is why you now it is known as super paramagnet The next question is from Tirupati. How saturation, magnetization, and coercivity varies with nanoparticle size and temperature? Okay, so when you reduce the size of the nanoparticle, okay, uh, what happens with the saturation, magnetization? Saturation, magnetization will decrease. Okay, now if it is a uh, oxide like you no know, Fe3O4 or uh, any ferrite like oxide. the saturation magnetization will decrease due to surface spin disorder meaning like no inside the material uh, your spins will be stable like this but since the size is reduced what happens at the surface surface area is increased so at the surface the spins will be will not have an, a strong exchange interaction so what will happen it will point to a different direction so there will be lot of uh, spins no which will be pointing to different direction at the surface of the nanoparticle so uh, that will give rise to surface uh, spin disorder so it, there is no perfect alignment of spins okay as per no perfect alignment of magnetic moments so that will reduce the magnetization so saturation magnetization will reduce for a nanoparticle the coercivity on the other hand when you reduce the particle size the coercivity will increase keep on increase from the bulk to uh, as we go towards the low smaller size uh, the coercivity will keep on increasing it will reach a maximum value so that is known as 
single domain size, critical single domain size. And then after that, it will try to decrease. So the when you go towards very, very small size, the coercivity will decrease and it will reach a value of nearly zero, that is superparamagnetism. So superparamagnetism is the property due to size effect. So when you go towards very, very small size, it will uh, the coercivity will become almost zero. So a hard magnetic material will behave like a soft magnetic material due to the size effect. So that these two are the effects. And if you are taking metallic material, then also the magnetization will reduce, but that is due to the oxide layer. So you may have an oxide layer on the surface of a metal, which will reduce the magnetization. Okay, so the last question. What are the reasons for zero, co zero coercivity of odd magnet? The zero coercivity, that's what I told you, due to super paramagnetism, you, you end up in getting uh, zero coercivity. Okay, so, uh, that's the question for the session. Uh, I would like to give a vote of thanks right now. Uh, never stop learning as a life never stops teaching, goes the proverb. This scientific webinar is one of its kind. To begin, I thank our speaker, Dr. Justin Sir, Associate Professor, NIT Trichy, for his humble acceptance to deliver the lecture. The lecture was well exemplary about compatible magnetic particles and was focused on characterization, which still stands to be a tough task for researchers. A gem is polished by friction and likewise, teaching comes with experience. This webinar is a proof of it. Thank you, sir. Administration of St. Joseph's Institute of Technology should definitely be acknowledged for this vision towards science. The real enrichers of the event, you, the participants, are thanked on behalf of physics and chemistry department staff members. Tomorrow, we have a session by 11 a.m. by Dr. Revati from Anna University on the topic porous materials and its application. Thank you, participants. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I thank the participants.